Math 287, Quest to College, I'm Joe Vasta. Today we're going to cover Gaussian elimination. And um, we actually already covered Gaussian elimination, or just a little bit of it, in 2.4. And in fact, in 2.4, we did this very example where we actually were given this matrix here. We reduced it to row echelon form. And then we reduced it to reduced row echelon form. So let's see what we're going to be doing in 2.5. You're going to be solving linear systems. Sometimes they'll be written like this, and other times they'll be written like AX equals B, where, and then they give you the A and the B. Now remember from a previous lecture that if you concatenate this 3 by 3 with this 3 by 1 matrix and put it into a matrix here, you have something called the augmented matrix. And so when you are doing a linear system, solving a linear system, um, whether they give it to you like this or they give it to you like this, the first thing that you're going to want to do is write the augmented matrix. And then the next thing you're going to want to do is row operations. The worst part for the homework in 2.5 is doing row operations. It's the worst part because it's the most tedious. Okay, It's not that it's mind-blowing and there's concepts that are flying above your head. What, what is difficult about it is just tedious. You make one little mistake, you, you can end up getting, and it's an arithmetic mistake, you can end up getting something that's completely different. So when you start with the augmented matrix and you do all row operations until you get to row echelon form. And then you go ahead and write down the three equations. You can see the first row represents the first equation. And the second row represents the second equation. And the third row, the third equation. And then you use back substitution to get your answer. That is called Gaussian elimination. So if they say solve this system using Gaussian elimination, then start you know, with the augmented matrix and stop with row echelon form. Now, if they ask you to solve a system using the Gauss-Jordan elimination technique, then you would start with your augmented matrix and take it all the way down to reduced row echelon form. And in terms of that, it's more row operations, but the payoff is at the very end, your three equations are right there and they tell you what the solution is, at least with one solution. And so you won't have to do as much back substitution. Now in the homework, if they give you a choice, then do it however you want in terms of these, you know, pick one of these. I usually pick the Gaussian elimination because by the time I get here with row operations, I'm already tired of doing that. You want to do these problems in your homework by hand. You don't want to we're not going to be plugging matrices into computer algebra systems on the exams. I'm going to um, be looking for work, step-by-step -step work from one matrix to the next matrix. So, um, that was a lot of stuff, but we, we did mention this in 2.4. And so, let's go ahead and show you some definitions. So, if you have your definition sheet, this is what you would see on there. Um, so, 2.5 is what we're covering. Um, the process of reducing the augmented matrix to row echelon form and then using back substitution to solve the equivalent system is called Gaussian elimination. No surprise there. The next definition says the process of reducing the augmented matrix to reduced row echelon form and then solving the equivalent system is called Gauss-Jordan elimination. And so, I don't think there's anything new. I just went ahead and showed you those definitions because they are on the definition sheet. So um, there's some new stuff. This stuff we kind of already covered in the last section. Um, and how much, yeah, I've gotten almost five minutes just recapping it. Um, but some new stuff that we want to point out here is we have this linear system and we have matrix A. So we could ask the question, what is the rank of A? Okay, so the rank of A is some number. 
Um, how do you find the rank of A? Well, you reduce A to row echelon form and see how many non-zero rows there are. So here's the deal. Let me see if I can find another one of these. Oh good, I have another one of these here. Um, when I re here's A augmented. A is just that matrix there, okay? That three by three matrix. So um, when I do row operations on this three by three to put it in row echelon form, those would be the same row operations that I would do for this three by four matrix. So that's why I'm covering this up. And to find the rank of A, you know, you would do the same row operations. And A is row equivalent to this. And there are one, two, three non-zero rows. So the rank of A is three. But not only that, I think I need to rip off another one of these. Call this me not being prepared, but oh well, it wasn't that, that long. If you keep reducing A, so look, I've covered up the right-hand side vector there. Um, A actually ends up being row equivalent to the identity matrix. So I'm going to write that down right there. So A is row equivalent to the identity. So the 3 by 3 identity is I3. Okay, so from time to time, I'm going to come back to this piece of paper when we get some more theorems and just point some things out about this example. So we can uncover this. I mean, we can also write other things down, like the rank of A augmented is also 3. But I'm not, I don't want to pollute this too much. There's already enough writing on this piece of paper. Let's go ahead and do the next problem. Now, the next problem is written out using the matrices AX equals B, and it's um, the directions here, I guess, should say solve. And so we're solving this linear system, and um, notice that matrix A is the same matrix that we have for example one. And the thing that's different about this example is the right-hand side vector is different. It says 6, 10, 1. So I'm going to go ahead, crank out some row operations, and you know, I would do this problem like, like I hadn't done problem number one, and we'll, you know, I'm not going to go back to the old lecture and see what row operations I've done. I'm just going to start from scratch here. So what I would do on this is I would say, oh, well, let's take a look at A augment, or A augmented. So we write out matrix A here. And then what we do is we put the right hand side vector right here. So this is 6, 10, 1. And lots of times, you know, you might see teachers put a line there. The line kind of reminds them that there's an equal. What this system really says is 3x minus y plus z equals 6, etc. And we actually, in this problem, weren't given that the variables are called x, y, z, but you'll see at the end it doesn't really matter. So let's go ahead and do some row operations. I'm going to start, um, when I do row operations, not writing the machine language, I'm going to try to do this a little quicker. I'm going to go row 1 minus row 3 gives me the new row 1. So 3 minus 2 is 1. And then we have negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. And then 1 minus a negative 1 is 2. And 6 minus 1 is 5. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm establishing a nice 1 for my pivot. I'm also going to do something different on this one. I'm not going to keep writing that line, the red line there. Okay, so um, I guess I'm going to go right here. I'm going to use the 1 as a pivot, and I'll multiply row 1 by a negative 3 to put opposites there so I can zero out that position. So this is negative 3, positive 9, negative 6, uh, negative 15. So when that happens, I'm going to add this modified row 1 to row 2, and that's going to give me the new row 2. 
So row one is going to be one, negative three, two, five. Row two, the new row two is going to be zero, ten, negative five, and negative five. Okay, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply row one by negative two to put a zero there. So this is negative two, positive six, negative four, negative ten. You also might notice um, today there is sort of a orangish tint with the lighting is because, you know, I use a lot of natural light when I do my videos and I believe there's fires, you know, this is, so you might remember back at the beginning of the semester, like on a Wednesday, that's when I'm filming this and the skies were a little red in the morning. Okay, so I add those together, I get zero. And then, um, okay, so I'm adding the modified row one, which is in green with row three, that's gonna become the new row three. So negative two plus two is zero, six plus two is eight. And then I have negative four and the negative one is negative five. And then I have negative 10 plus a one is negative nine. Okay, so that gets me that far. I'm gonna continue with this. And um, when I continue with this, I'm gonna go ahead and scale down the row Two. Now you might have remembered us doing uh, you know, some similar row operations, maybe identical row operations in the last section because the matrix A is the same matrix. Okay, so I'll multiply row two by one fifth. But that's all right. Um, it's, it's good to just see the teacher do some problems. So you know, as a student, you can go, oh yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. Okay, so row one stays the same. Row two is gonna be zero, two, negative one, negative one. And row three, I, I can't scale down without getting some fractions. I don't wanna have fractions here. Okay, I'm gonna use this two as a pivot. I'm gonna multiply row two by a negative four. And so when that happens, I have zero, negative eight, positive four, positive four. I'm gonna add that to row, um, I'm gonna add that to row three and that's gonna become the new row three. So I end up getting one, negative three, two, five, zero, two, negative one, negative one, and then zero, zero, um, negative one, and then this one is negative five. Okay, um, this matrix is almost in row echelon form. I could scale that, so that's a one there. Of course, there would put fractions right there. And then I could multiply the last row by negative one. What I'm going to do on this one, I'm gonna use the um, Gauss-Jordan elimination and reduce this matrix all the way to reduced row echelon form, just so you can see see that happen. So we'll do that here. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, multiply row three by a negative one. I'm just gonna make those plus signs. And I'm gonna add row three with row two. That's gonna become the new row two. So zero, zero, one, Five. Now some of you are like, you should have just done back substitution, but ah, we'll do this. And then look at this, this is zero, two, and then a plus one, a minus one, that's a zero. And then this gives me a four here, because five minus one. Then I'm gonna multiply row three by a negative two. So I end up getting zero, zero, negative two, negative 10. I'm going to add that to row one. That's going to give me the new row one, which would be one, negative three, zero, and then this is negative five. Okay, I'm almost done with this. I'm going to go ahead and multiply row one by a two and multiply row two by a three.
So um, modified road one would be two, negative six, zero, negative 10. I'm trying to put opposites on those positions there and I'm using the two as a pivot to put a zero there. So this is gonna be zero, six. Okay, so that's set up nicely, zero, 12. Okay, so when I do that, well, I need another piece of paper. I know some people are like, well, you're wasting trees. Um, but this is a good cause here. This is to learn some linear algebra. It's always, it's always worth it a little to waste a tree or two. So um, I'm going to add those two modified rows together to give me a new row one, which will be 2, 0, 0, 2. And then I have 0, 2, 0, 4, and 0, 0, 1, 5. And like if I had done Gaussian elimination um, right when I was almost in row echelon form, I'd probably be done. Okay, it's just row operations take a long time. I'm going to go ahead and scale down row 1 and 2. So row 1 is going to be 1, 0, 0, 1 and row 2 is going to be 0, 1, 0, 2. Row 3 will just leave the way it is. I'm going to go ahead and put my red line here. Remembering that this is X, this is Y, this is Z. And so when I finish this off, my first equation says X equals 1, my second equation says Y equals 2, and my third equation says Z equals 5. And that's what I get. So, I mean, a lot of this problem here was row operations, what we learned in the last sections. And that's going to be the worst part, the most um, lengthy part of your homework is doing row operations. So let's come back over here. And, you know, maybe in a different color, I'll do it in purple. So, you know, this matrix here was row equivalent to 1, 0, 0, 1. So I'm just being a little repetitious here. 0, 1, 0, 2, and then 0, 0, 1, 5. Now, you're a future engineer or other major, or technical major, and you have to do this on the job. Um, it's very easy to plug this into a computer and have the computer do this for you. So you're not spending your whole time in your cubicle cranking out arithmetic unless you really want to do that. And I think we discussed that in the last video. And so on this one, I mean, I'm being, I'm being redundant on purpose because I want this on the same piece of paper. This was X equals 1 y equals 2, z equals 5. And actually, when I wrote the answer over here, I should have written, you know, my final answer is 1, 2, 5. That is the final answer. So, 1, 2, 5. So, let's take a look at what we have here. We have this matrix A, we knew from the last problem and we pointed it out, has rank three and can, through row operations, be um, row equivalent to the identity. So that's what we have there. Um, let me fix something. The other laptop I'm looking at is making noise. So this is um, row equivalent to the identity, and we could have said the same thing here. Look at this, this guy right here. I mean, it's the same matrix, row equivalent to the identity. Okay, so that's that's not surprising. Um, and let me move some of this work out of the way here. This system here. AX equals B, well, the way it's set up right here, has a unique solution. For this problem, it's 1, 2, 5. And notice, like, look at this. So on this one here, I don't know how to fit it all. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just fit it like this. This is problem number one. When the right-hand side vector was 8, 16, 6, 
its unique solution was 2, 4, 6. Now, we're using the same matrix, matrix A, except the right-hand side vector became 6, 10, 1, just because I changed it to that. And it gives me the answer, instead of 2, 4, 6, you know, like right there, it gives me the answer of 1, 2, 5. So that means something, and I'll write it right below here, that A, X equals B, has a unique solution for every vector B in R3. Isn't that what the vector B is in R3? So like in the, like if another example, I changed this to whatever, like, one half, negative two, 50, it would go in here, you would do the same exact row operations, and the only thing that would be different about that problem is that right-hand side vector as you're doing row operations would change not to one, two, five, but to something else, and it's not always gonna be pretty. It's not gonna be nice integers. So that's what we're getting at, is if you've got a matrix A that's row equivalent to the identity, so this has to be a 3x3 three three system for that to happen, then AX equals B has a unique solution for every B in R3. Now there are some cryptography applications of this, but we're not going to get into that because we want to now go ahead, this was, this was example 2, I'll find out where my example 3 is lying, I know it's somewhere, here it is, look at this, here's example number three. And what do you notice about example number three? Well, A is the same thing. And I, now I've just changed my um, right-hand side vector B to zero, zero, zero. So the way you would start off on this one is go A augmented equals, you know, we would write out three, three, two, negative one, one, two, 1, 1, negative 1, and then we'd go ahead, you know, I'll go ahead and do that, put the line there and put 0, 0, 0. Well, don't you know that when you do any row operation on this augmented matrix, you know, like you might say like 3 times row 3 minus 2 times row 2, not that I would do that one, um, gives me the new row 2. These zeros will never change because 3 times 0 minus 2 times 0, you know, that's going to give me a 0. And so this right hand side here will always stay 0, 0, 0. Not the case when you had a 6, 10, 1. And so the reason I'm doing that is because I'm extremely lazy. And remember, I told you that we could dwindle this down and we actually did it. We could, um, this is, this 3 by 3 matrix is row equivalent. Now, if I hadn't done problem two or problem one, um, I wouldn't know that. I would have to then do row operations to see if that happens, because there are going to be times when you have this situation, and it doesn't dwindle down to the identity. It dwindles down to one, zero, 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 one, zero, and zero, zero, zero. And we'll see what happens when that happens. Okay, but if we know that, because look, we can see that that's what, that's what happened right there. And I'll circle this in yellow again. So this guy right here. So we can only go this quickly on this problem because we we have the same matrix A for the last problem. We know that these three numbers are going to be 0, 0, 0. So when you go to do, um, you know, you're doing the, the Gauss-Jordan elimination, because this is in a reduced row echelon form, your first equation says x equals 0 y equals 0 and z equals 0. So you have 0, 0, 0 as the solution. And we did talk about some theory a few sections ago that every homogeneous system will have the trivial solution, the trivial solution being 0, 0, 0. 
And so, I mean, that theorem is correct. We may have forgotten that theorem, but look, it comes out right here. Now, in problems one, two, and three, each time that um, system had exactly one solution. So sometimes your systems could have one, sometimes they can have zero solutions, and sometimes they can have infinitely many. So know that. Um, so with this problem, remember how we said AX equals B has a unique solution for every B in R3? That's for this example. Well, let's look at this. AX equals zero has only the trivial solution. Not that we have to write these these things out when we are doing our homework. This I'm just pointing some things out. So there's a lot of theory flying around on this. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a theorem. And so here it is right there. So let A be a square matrix, real elements. The following conditions on A are equivalent. I'm going to jump down to condition four because I like that one. A is row equivalent to the identity, okay, I N, and in our case N was 3. So condition 3 says, so these are equivalent, that a condition 3 says that the rank of A is going to be 3 or N, okay. Condition 1 says AX equals B has a unique solution for every B in R3 or RN. And we wrote that out after problem 2. And then problem three illustrated this, AX equals zero has only the trivial solution, which is vector X equals the zero vector. Okay, so those four conditions are equivalent. This theorem is gonna be stated again and again, and what's gonna happen is each time I state it in future sections, it's going to grow, meaning we're gonna put more conditions on that. Okay, so um, that is some theory there. If A is not row equivalent to an, the identity, then this theorem does not apply. Then, then everything's out the window and you just have to, to see what you get then. Okay, so that was problem number three, which we, did, we looked at a theorem now. So let's go ahead and do problem number four, another system right here. Remember we said in an earlier section there's three equations so there's the system is three and then there's three unknowns so this one's three by three. This is a three by three system. Let's go ahead. It, it's different. It doesn't have the same matrix A. I'm going to jump right to the augmented matrix and I'm going to start doing row operations. Now this is a good opportunity for you to pause the video right here to see if you can do this problem on your own. Okay, so A augmented happens to be 1, 1, 1, 1, 3, 1, negative 3, negative 4. If you're wondering where I'm getting those numbers, they're the coefficients up there. And then we have 5, 6, 8, 8. So we'll try to do this one you know, quickly. I'm not going to write down the machine language. That was only to get us used to this. Some of you are going to probably continue to do that because maybe that helps troubleshoot if you did something wrong. Now, probably I'll do something wrong on this one and then I'll have to troubleshoot. It's Murphy's Law. Okay, so here it goes. Row operations. I'm going to go ahead and use this one as a pivot. I'm going to multiply row one by a negative three and I'm going to get negative 3, negative 3, negative 3, negative 3, and that's going to be added to row 2. That will become the new row 2. So what do we have here? 1, 1, 1, 1, and then I add those two. The modified row 1 with row 2 is going to give me the new row 2, so 3 minus 3 is 0. 1 minus 3 is negative 2, negative 3 and a negative 3 is a negative 6, and negative 4 and a negative 3 is negative 7. Okay, now let's go ahead and multiply row 1 by negative 5. So this is negative 5, negative 5, 
negative five, negative five. If you are sitting in your apartment and your um, roommate's eavesdropping on your YouTube video that you're watching right now, they're going to be like, what class are you taking? Why does he keep screaming out negative five? Uh, because it's funny. I don't know why. So this is zero. And then because five minus five, six minus five is one. Eight minus five is three. Eight minus five is three. Okay, so that's where we are now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and um, switch row three and row two. Okay, so I'll interchange them. And oh, wait a minute, I need to get a new piece of paper here. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, you got room over there. Um, that, that is a good point, but. I just like to keep working these things going down here. So interchanging row two and three. So one, 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 zero, one, three, three. Um, and this one's going to be zero, negative two, negative six, negative seven. Some of you may have decided to multiply that by negative one as you did that, but oh well, I did. And I'm going to use this one as a pivot. I'm going to get opposites there on those two spots. So multiply row two by a two, which will give me zero, two, six, six. I'm gonna add that to row three. That's gonna become my new row three. And let's see what we get here. One, 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 zero, one, three, three. And then this is zero, zero, because two minus two, and then six minus six is zero, and then negative seven and a six, this gives you negative one. Okay, so um, really I could say, uh, multiply the last row by a negative one, and this puts the matrix in row echelon form. I'm not gonna do reduced row echelon form because I can get immediate results now. So remember that this is x, y, z, and we write out the equations, I get x, with black I guess, x plus y plus z equals one. The second equation is y plus three z equals three. But here, here's the weird part about this. The third equation says zero, equals one. That's bad news. When zero equals one, it sort of ruins your day. And um, our original question was to solve that system. So we're solving a system. And when we get zero equals one, that tells you something. It tells you that there is no solution. There's your answer. So all that worked for nothing. Or we, we learned a new word a few sections ago, ago. This is inconsistent. So that's another way of saying no solution. Inconsistent means it has no solution. And that is the deal with this matrix here. So, or with this, this problem. So there's a few things that we wanna point out about this problem. The first thing I wanna point out is this guy right here is we could we could sometimes call that matrix A. It's not the A from the last few problems. It's a different A. And um, look what happens when you go to reduce your matrix there. Does this matrix A could it ever be equivalent? to the identity and the answer is no because there's zeros there. So this, you know, we have that theorem that we looked at. This does not fit the mold of the theorem because your matrix A is not equivalent to the identity. It never could be. There's no way you can do a row operation and get this thing equaling the identity I3. Okay, so let's write some facts down here and we'll, we'll write them right here. See that the rank of A in this example happens to be, well, what is it? Here's A is the thing that is circled. 
So let's just write that. I'm going to put an A there in yellow. I don't know how visible that is on the video, but that there's an A there. So A is in yellow. The rank of A, to find the rank, you reduce the matrix using row operations and count the number of non-zero rows. The rank of A is 2. The rank of A augmented that's the whole 3 by 4 matrix. Well, you know, if, if you're considering these numbers here, then it actually has rank 3. Okay, so now I think it's time to look at this theorem here. <clears throat> okay, so we have a theorem that says, consider the m by n linear system. So our system happens to be, what's our system? Our system is three by three. Okay, AX equals B. Um, your solution, you know, when you're going to try to solve this, will be inconsistent if and only if the rank of A is less than the rank of A augmented. That's exactly what we have there. Um, your system will be consistent if and only if those ranks are the same. And let me go ahead and go back to this one here. So, this guy right here, we never really asked it, but I'm going to write it down now. The rank of A augmented in problem number one happens to be three as well. So when those guys are the same, you're going to have a consistent solution. Consistent means at least one solution. And that's what the theorem says. Okay, and it's, um, we've seen that theorem work, and I, it's best for me to do some examples and then take a look at these theorems, because if you look at the theorems first, you're like, well, what does that mean? So when the rank, you know, we actually saw one, the rank of A is less than the rank of A augmented, which basically means, this is the fancy way of saying that on this inconsistent one, you have um, a row that goes 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then you have your equal sign, which is that. This is after you reduce it, and then on the other side of that equal sign, you have a non-zero number. Essentially, you have the equation from that row saying 0 equals like 5, or 0 equals negative 1, or whatever. And so, um, are you sunk if you forgot this theorem, and you're doing your homework? No! Um, you don't have to memorize these theorems word for word you can still get the same results without even knowing this theorem, but this theorem kind of helps build the theory. Um, and if you have some of these theorems sort of in your head, it will make you a little more confident when you're doing the problems. So this would also explain why a homogeneous system. A homogeneous system has all zeros on the right hand side. That would explain why the homogeneous system is always consistent because you would never have the ranks being different like this. The ranks would always be the same if you if you had all zeros on the right hand side. And maybe that was saying a little too much. So let's move on to problem number five because we've seen in problems number one, two, and three one solution and problem four we've seen no solution. So We've got to cover some problems where you have infinitely many solutions because those ones are going to be um, new for a lot of people. So let's take a look at problem number five. And you can't just take a look at a system you know, that has three variables. You, you can't always just look at it and go, oh yeah, I, I see that it's going to have one solution, unless you're some sort of genius. So lots of times you see this and you don't know what you're going to get. There are some times you see that one equation is a multiple of another, or whatever, but lots of times you just have to jump in with row operations. And that is what I'm going to do for problem number five. So, first thing I'm going to do actually is draw out the augmented matrix. And as we do this problem, we're going to um, throw some definitions at you right in the middle of the problem, okay? Because it's going to be a good time to do that. So we have 1, 3, negative 4 for the first column. And we have 2, 2, negative 1, 3, 1, 2, and 5, 3, 1. Okay. So there it is. 
there's my augmented matrix and what I'm gonna do is the fun part is it really fun I don't know I'm going to be reducing this to row echelon form so I'll stop at row echelon form and do the Gaussian elimination instead of going all the way to reduced row echelon form and so I'm going to use this one as a pivot I'm going to multiply row one by a negative three to put opposites there okay so this is going to be negative three and then we have this is negative three negative six negative nine negative fifteen and that's going to go ahead and be added to row two here's modified row one plus row two gives me the new row two i'm going to leave a little space because i'm going to um, do the other step within this this step here so i have one two three five zero because i'm adding those and then negative six plus two is negative four negative nine plus one is negative eight and negative 15 plus three is negative 12. Okay, now let's multiply row one by a positive four and put opposites right there where the pivot is and with that negative four, those are opposites. So I get negative four, this is modified row one. Um, <laughs> negative four, I don't know about that negative four. Let's go ahead and get rid of the negative. Okay, so four, eight, 12, 20 and I'm going to add that to row 3 and that's going to give me the new row 3 so negative 4 plus 4 is 0 and then 8 minus 1 is 7 12 and 2 give me 14 and 20 plus 1 is 21 okay I need another piece of paper here and I'm going to scale down rows 2 and rows 3. So how do I scale them down? I'm going to multiply row 2 by negative 1 fourth and multiply row 3 by 1 seventh. I'm not going to get any fractions when that happens, so that's a good thing. So first row is 1, 2, 3, 5. Then I have 0, 1, 2, Three, and then on this one I have 0, 1, 14 divided by 7, 2, 21, 3. So what do we have here? We have row 2 and row 3 are identical. And I believe that did come up in a previous lecture. But if you're wondering how to deal with that, you would just go row 2 minus row 3 becomes the new row 3. So really one of those rows is going to get zeroed out. So this is all zeros. This matrix is in row echelon form. Here's your leading ones. There's only two leading ones. Here's your equal sign. We'll put the variables in blue this time. Here's X, here's Y, here's Z. So this is the deal. We have the rank of A equals Two, and you're like, what is A? A is this guy right here, so I'll circle this in yellow. A has three rows, but the rank of A is two. And, um, and I don't have to write this down, the rank of A augmented, which is this three by four matrix, is also two. So this means that, you know, that it's gonna be consistent here, and, um, how am I going to play this game here? Well, let's do our next definition. Next definition is this one right here. It says consider um, the m by n linear system ax equals b, and consider and consider a system that is consistent. Okay, reduce a to row echelon form. The variables that have leading ones in their columns are called bound. The variables that do not have leading ones in their columns are called free. Okay, so that is really going to help us. Go ahead and label this. So the um, variables, so there's three variables here. The ones that have leading ones in their column 
They're called bound. This guy is bound. X is bound. Y also has a leading one, so Y is also bound. Z does not have a leading one, so Z is called free. Now, in the future, I'm going to go B, B, F, or, you know, I'm just, I'll just use the first letter. And so what we have is we have two columns that have pivots, or you can call them the two pivot columns. And when this happens, when you have a free variable, that means you have infinitely many solutions, okay? And the rationale behind that is you are free to select any value of Z and then Y and X are going to be bound um, depending on that choice of, of what you picked for Z. And that's what's going to give you your infinitely many solutions. So let's just make this the center page and write out row 1 and row 2 in terms of the equation. So I have x plus 2y plus 3z equals 5. And the other one is y plus 2z equals 3. So what I'm saying, and I'll do this in purple, what I'm saying is I could say, well, z equals, and I'm free to select anything. Like, what if z equals 1? Then the second row would give me y plus 2 times 1 equals 3. y also coincidentally equals 1. I didn't know that would happen. But okay, so and then the, um, the first row or the first equation would then give me that would really be funny if this one was also going to be 1. It would be x plus 2 times 1 plus 3 times 1. I'm going ahead and writing out this equation with y1 and z1. This equals 5. And actually it's x plus 5 equals 5. So actually x equals 0 on this. So one of the solutions here is 0, 1, 1. And that solution would satisfy this equation. And um, what equation is that? Well, it will satisfy, sorry, the system. And look, if you put that in there, look, if, if x is 0 and y is 1 and z is 1, you have 0 plus 2 plus 3 is 5. And then you have 0 plus 2 plus 1 is 3. And then this one you have 0 minus 1 plus 2. So you have negative 1 plus 2, and that's 1. So this does work. Now the problem with using this method here, and I'll put it in a cloud because hopefully we'll never do that again, where we have infinitely many solutions and say, hey, let's just start putting values in for z. Um, that would take you the rest of your life, and you wouldn't even get done with it if you were just picking values, because what if z is 7 fourths? Well, yeah, that should work, and it will give us some, and it will give us another point. So. What we do in linear algebra is we let the free variable equal a parameter. So z is going to equal t. Now when that happens, if you take a look at the second equation, the second equation says y plus 2 times t equals 3. So this is going to say y equals 3 minus 2t. I'm going to circle that. And then the first equation, I plug my value of z in there, which is t, and my value of y in there, which is 3 minus 2t, and see what I, see what I get. x plus 2 times y, 2 times 3 minus 2t plus 3 times z, 3 times t, equals 5. So x plus 6 minus 4t plus 3t equals 5. x plus 6 minus t equals 5. So x equals t 
minus 1. Whoa, almost didn't have enough room there. And now what we're going to do is we are going to list, you remember how this was one solution, but there's infinitely many solutions. Because we used a parameter, we can write our solution x, y, z. So here's x, which is t minus 1. y is 3 minus 2t. And z is t. And so for now, this is going to be acceptable, where we can just write our answer like that. And this covers them all. And look what happens when t is 2, no, sorry, when t is 1, which kind of like what we did here, t is 1, you end up getting 0, 3 minus 2, that's 1, and 1. And so you end up getting that value for when t equals 1. But this gives you all values. Your book is going to write the answer like this. They're going to so this is what your book's going to do. Your book's going to say um, the set of all points that look like this. So this is a little bit more precise. But for now, you can just write it what I have boxed right above here. Okay, the camera just shut off. Um, so I'm continuing to do that. I don't know why it shuts off after 50 some minutes. Um, I did get this camera at a garage sale so that might explain things oh so your book writes it like this and then there's such that instead of a line they have like a colon and then they say t is any real number okay and so that's what that the book's going to write it as so this is infinitely many solutions and let me write that down here. So this is infinitely, infinitely, that's an L-Y, many solutions. And this is a parameterization. Now, some of you might go, oh, wait a minute, Joe. Can't I just, instead of saying Z equals T, just Z is itself, and then write these coordinates in terms of Zs? Well, you'll probably burn yourself later on if you get into that bad habit. We always want to use a different letter when we have infinitely many solutions because it will come back and bite us in some situations. So you want to use T as your parameter. Um, infinitely many solutions, what that means, and I may have explained this you know, in an earlier video, is I have three planes Okay, so there they are, one, two, three, and then let's just assume this plane comes out, I, maybe I didn't explain this one. This plane comes out like this, and I know you're thinking, well, that's a line, okay, but let's say the plane comes right at you, and then you have another plane that looks like this, and maybe you've, you've walked around three space until you can actually see this, where the planes kind of look like lines because you're looking right down them, and then the third one's like this. Now those three lines, it looks like they cross at a point, but if their plane's coming out towards you, um, they cross at a line. That line being described is this. So if you had calculus three, you know that you can describe a line in um, three space by um, parameters. X equals this, Y equals that, Z equals this. So there's infinitely many ways that you can write your parameterization. So know that. Also know that you could have said, now we don't want to encourage this, but on this particular example it works, where you could have said y equals t, and then z would equal something in terms of t from the second equation, and then x would equal something in terms of t from the first equation. So you could do that, but that will sometimes get you if you just go willy-nilly and go, oh, we'll just let t equal x, because sometimes it, there's a different I'm going to use a word that's weird, dependency relationship, and you might end up losing information in your answer. So the rule of thumb of where you'll get 100% accuracy if you, if you do your arithmetic correctly is when you have bounds and frees, you set your free variable equal to t. Okay, So that is a good rule of thumb. The other thing that I want to say is, you know, remember the example where we got no solution? That would be like if 
Okay, so I'm coming back to the geometry behind this. You have three planes and there's no solution. That would be like this plane, and let's just assume the plane's coming up at you, and then this plane right here, and let's assume that's coming at you, and then the third plane's like this. Well, do these three planes, even though they look like lines, but they're coming up toward you, do they ever touch in one common point, all three at the same time? No, they don't. And so that's a picture that can happen in higher dimensions. Of course, when three planes touch and there's one solution, which was like problems one, two, and three, that's like one of the planes being the ceiling, another plane being a wall, the other plane being a wall that touches that wall, and then so the, the point where they cross is like at the top corner and on the ceiling. Okay, so this completes this problem. I think we should do our last theorem and then we'll just do a few other problems. Let a linear system be consistent. Okay. All variables are bound if and only if the system has one solution. So basically what this theorem is saying is, um, I can't even, oh yeah, it's right under here. I'm like trying to find the piece of paper that's under here. What they're saying is when you have bound, 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 then um, you're only going to get one solution. Okay, so once you have a free agent in there, you're going to get infinitely many. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, could you show us the example? I don't even know. <sighs> oh, yeah, look, right here. So this is problem number two. Um, this is X. This is Y. This is Z. Look what we have here. We have bound, bound, bound. And so when they're all bound, you get what? One solution. Okay, once again, on that last theorem, if you like forget it or don't memorize it, you're not lost. You just have to know how to crank out these systems that you get in your homework. Let's go ahead and do the next problem. Problem number six. Okay, so this right here is a three by three system, three equations, three unknowns, and I'm, this time I'm giving you just AX equals B. So some of your problems will be written like this. The first thing that I want to do is write out the augmented matrix. The augmented matrix looks like this. One, negative two, negative three, two, negative four, negative six, three, one, one, and then here we have five, four, five. So that is the augmented matrix. And what I would ask you to do is pause the video and see if you could do row operations to get to the end. Okay. So um, what I'm going to start doing because I want to focus on infinitely many solutions and frees and bounds is I am going to omit, I'm not going to include all my work on the row operations. So when I did the work, so there's a lot in that little symbol there, I ended up getting one, two, three, five, and then zero, zero, one, two, and then the last row was all zeros. So this is what it looks like. We know this is, we're not gonna get inconsistent. This one's, this one's consistent. And let's take a look at our pivots, our leading ones. We have a one here and a one there. We were never given the variables, but I have three variables. I'm gonna call them X, Y, and Z. Your book might, might call them x1, x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3. So look what we have here. We have the situation where we're going to label these bound or free. This first one is bound. The second one does not have a leading one, so it's free. And the third one is bound. So it's going to be y that's going to equal t in this example. And if you decide, hey, I'm just going to let z equal t, you'll see how you can get burnt on that. Let's write out the equations. Okay, so notice that a lot of this work I did not show you. I just said, okay, suppose you can reduce it, you'll get this. So the first equation says x plus 2y plus 3z 
equals 5. The second equation says z equals 2. Now, we didn't say this in the last problem, just because maybe, for me, it was really obvious, and I should have said this, but this third equation, it says 0 equals 0. Okay, that means green light. Go ahead and try to find the solutions. So now, maybe you can see why it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be the best idea to just say, hey, let's let z equal the parameter, because look, z has to equal 2. Y, because it is free, equals t. So I'll put a little circle around the f and say that's why we set it equal to t. And then this first equation here, we'll write it out, x plus 2t plus Three times, what's the value of z? It is 2. This equals 5. So x plus 2t plus 6 equals 5. What does x equal? x equals, looks like it's going to be negative 2t minus 1. So now we have our infinitely many solutions. Um, make sure you write the x first. This is negative 2t minus 1, comma, then the y is t, and the z is 2. Another parameterization of a line in 3 space. You don't have to draw any pictures of 3 space like you have to do in calculus 3. There were two pivot columns. By the way, this was a 3 by 3 system which means three equations and three unknowns. And the three by three system, that, that right there looks like the size of a matrix will always be the size of matrix A. Not of the augmented matrix, but of the matrix A. We can also say that the rank of A equals the rank of A augmented equals two. We don't, really don't have to say all that stuff. So that is pretty much how you do your homework problems. I'm going to do a few more homework problems or homework things that look like the homework. Um, the rationale behind that is because sometimes you might get more than one free variable. And so we have to deal with that. And um, in future problems, I'm going to say A augmented is equivalent and I'm just going to start off with the matrix after it had all of its row operations done. Okay, now, I'll put this little chart, though it might be stupid for most of you guys. Um, so, I'm going to ask the question, does rank A equal rank A augmented? I guess I'll put the question there. And if the answer is no, then there are zero solutions. Or lots of times we say no solution. If the answer is, not that you're going to be going to this little flow diagram when you're working on your homework, but it just kind of shows you another way of looking at this. If the answer is yes, then the next question is, are the variables all bound? If the answer is no, then there's infinite solutions. And if the answer is yes, they are all bound, then you have one solution. Okay. Some of you are like, well, that was the stupidest thing I've seen. You really can't say something like that because I'm sure you've seen stupider things in your life than this. Let's go ahead and see one of those things. No, let's go ahead and do the next problem here. Okay, so here is the next problem. I'm not even telling you what the system was. I'm not telling you what A is. I'm not even telling you what A augmented is, but it's a three by three system. Um, there's the equal sign if you'd like. Um, my variables, you know, we'll keep with the X, the Y, and the Z, and this is the way it came out here. How many leading ones do I have in this um, row echelon form matrix? Well, I have one leading one. 
Oh, by the way, this is also reduced row echelon form, but maybe I should not have said that. Okay, so that means we have, for the first variable, we're going to classify that as bound. X is bound, Y is free, Z is free. So um, since Z is free, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Z equal T. Y is free, so now we need another parameter. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to step back one in the alphabet and say S. So S and T are common parameter names. If you needed another one, you would use R. First equation. So I'll just put an arrow right here. It says this. X plus 2Y plus 3Z equals 5. X plus 2S plus 3t equals 5. I'm going to solve for x here. x is 5 minus 2s minus 3t. There's x, there's y, there's z. I'm going to go ahead and write that out as an ordered triple. So here we have it. And make sure you don't make the mistake of going, oh, the first one's T, the second one's S, and the third one's that, because X is first. Did you see that? And so we have 5 minus 2S minus 3T. The second coordinate is Y, which is S. The third coordinate is Z, which is T. I said earlier, and I never really pointed it out when I was finished, that it, when you have a problem like this, or it's written in the matrix way, and they don't give you the variables X, Y, Z, you can make your variables happy face, sad face, and star. Do you see X, Y, Z written out in the final answer? No. So the variables pretty much, you know, when they don't give them to you, it really doesn't matter because in the end, you're just looking at this. So that was a 3x3 three three system. We had one pivot column. And we have our infinitely many solutions. Oh, the funny thing is, if there were three equations, they were all three planes. And they were probably all multiples of each other because the intersection point of the three planes, which I didn't give you, by the way, um, happened to be, this is not a line in three space. This is a plane in three space. And it actually describes this plane right there. Let's go ahead and do two more problems that are like this. And then um, I'll show you an application with circuits. Okay, a three by four system. Three by four. Now you might be looking at this and going, well, Joe, it looks like you got it wrong because this is a three by five matrix. But remember, three describes how many rows or how many equations and four describes how many variables. And so I do have four variables. They are X, Y, Z, and W. And some of you are thinking, well, shouldn't you have put your W first? No, this is just the way I do it. It's a matter of style. And it's probably going to drive some of you crazy. And if you're going so crazy you hate this, then switch to the other Odella class. They have less people in there. So there's more room when you're watching those videos. There's not as many, many people watching the videos. And that's it's pretty inconvenient when that happens. But um, for the rest of you who are that doesn't totally annoy you, that's just what I'm going to do. And, you know, once again, you can say happy face, sad face, star, and, you know, pick another lucky charm. Um, you're not even going to see those variables in the answer. I think your book on this one would say X of 1, X2, X3, X4. Let's go ahead and um, circle all of our leading ones or box them all. Now we're going to go through and label bound and free. So X is, has a leading one, it's bound. Y is free. Z is bound. W is bound. Okay, I'm going to write out the last equation. The last equation says W equals 3. Okay, well, that's, that's nothing we can do with that. And then the second equation says Z plus 2w equals 1. z plus 2 times 3. So I'm going to skip a few more steps as we do more of these. So this is really z plus 6 equals 1. z equals negative 5. 
Okay, now before I write out the first equation, now I have the free variable, which is y, so we'll just say y equals t. Okay, and the first equation I'll just put right here, it says x. So I'm going to see, I'm going to skip a step on here and we'll see how many people we lose because that's that's always a fun game to play when you're a teacher and that's why I miss going face to face because of face to face I play that game all the time see how many people you lose in the class and you can tell by the expressions on the face and right now um, I don't see any faces so I have x plus 2y so plus 2t plus 3z so plus 3 times negative 5 plus 4w, 4 times 3, this equals 5, almost ran off the paper. So that I was getting a little scared when I was writing that out there. I have x plus 2t minus 15 plus 12 equals 5. I'll just write this out a little more. So x plus 2t minus 3 equals so it looks like x is going to equal 8 minus 2t, or you can write negative 2t plus 8. So what do we have here? Since we have four variables, see it's a, this is the first time we have four variables, it's not going to be an order triple, it's going to be an order quadruple or a four tuple. And so my four tuple is going to look like, oops, okay, so I have room here. I'm going to start off with x, 8 minus 2t. And then the y is t, and the z is negative 5, and the w is 3. You might be thinking, well, what is this? This thing lives in four space. Spatial four, four spaces is very hard to, to imagine because we are flatlanders when it comes to four space. And um, this is a line in four space. Okay, there were three pivot columns. And one free variable, one free variable means you're only going to see one parameter, which is t. The last problem before we actually show you the application, and well, there's actually many applications, is this problem right here, which is a 4x5 system. Um, I want you to pause the video and see if you can come up with the answer because there are five variables. It's going to be a five tuple for the answer. So pause the video and then when you're done, play it and see if you get the right answer. Okay, let me go ahead and put the equal sign. I'm going to go ahead and identify all my um, leading ones. There's one right there, and there's one right there. My variables, this is where I draw the line. And I'm not going to go x, y, z anymore. I'm going to go x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. Okay, so we have what the leading ones are, we have bound, and um, this guy right here, x2 is free, x3 is free, x4 is bound, x5 is free. Okay, so we'll start off with x5. x5 is free, therefore we'll call them t. Circle that. Okay, now we have the next one, x4, and when we see him here is in this equation, the last two equations say 0 equals 0. So I'm not going to write those down, so the second equation says x4 minus 2x5 equals 0. By the way, this system has all zeros on the right-hand side. It's called homogeneous. And if you remember the theorem, the homogeneous solution will contain the trivial solution, which would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Some of you are like, gee, thanks for pointing that out in the video. So x4 minus 2t equals 0. So it looks like x4 equals 2t. x3 is free. So x3, I'll put that up here, x3 is going to be s. And x2 is also free. So x2, I'll make that r x1 is bound, so I'm going to go ahead and write out the equation here. So this is x1 plus 
2x2 plus 3x3 plus 4x4 plus 5x5 equals 0. Almost didn't make it. So this is x1 plus 2 times x2, so 2r, plus 3 times x3, 3s, plus 4 times x4, so this is um, 4 times this guy right here, would be 8t, and then 5 times x5, so this is 5t. This equals 0. I'm going to go ahead and do some of the algebra in my head. So x1 is going to equal negative 2r, um, minus 3s, and then right there I have 13t, so this is going to be minus 13t. Let's write out our 5 tuple here, which we start with x1. Minus 2r minus 3s minus 13t. And then x2 is r, x3 is s, x4 is 2t, x5 is t. We are now in 5 space. This is the parameterization of not a line, of not a plane, but of like the kind of space we live in. And, and that's a thin slice of 5 space. There are two pivot columns. There are many applications for what we're doing. One of the applications is curve fitting. Um, which you'll find in statistics, network analysis, economics, traffic analysis, engineering. Um, there's systems of equations all over the place. The worst part about your homework will be the row operations. So let's go on over to the PowerPoint and take a look at an example, an application of this. Um, in the world of circuits. So here's our application, an electrical network, um, a circuit, and this one's rather complicated. It has three paths on it. So let me turn the pointer on here. So there's path one, path two, path three. Now, if you've never seen one of these before, don't start freaking out and thinking, oh no, I'm gonna be seeing these in the homework. This is just showing you that there's an application. Will we see circuits later on when we do differential equations? Yeah, but they won't be as complicated as this. So we have these junctions here. They look like circles around those. And resistors are right there. And they measure something called resistance. We have batteries. And um, we have these laws. They're called Kirchhoff's laws. And um, the first one says, all the current flowing into a junction must flow out of it. That seems pretty straightforward. The sum of the products. IR, current times resistance, around a closed path is equal to the total voltage in the path. And once again, if you've never seen this, you're probably like going to say, what? Well, this is stuff that um, some kinds of engineers will study, and it's very applicable to the real world. The current is measured in amps, amps um, the resistance ohms, and I times R is volts. So let's take a look at how we can put Kirchhoff's laws into equations. We're not going to really see how we can do it. We'll just show you. So Kirchhoff's first law gives you these four equations with I1 through I6. Okay, you see those guys there. And Kirchhoff's second law gives you these three equations. And you still see the I1 and the I, I through I6. Um, there are seven equations and six unknowns. So this is a seven by six linear system. And what would you do if you were working on this? You know, you're an engineer, you would go ahead and put these into an augmented matrix. There's the augmented matrix. Of course, this augmented matrix, there is a line right here. You could put the line there, you don't have to put it there. And that kind of represents the equal sign. So look at the first equation, it looks kind of weird because it says I1 plus I3 equals I2. We can bring I2 to the left-hand side. So it says I1 minus I2 plus I3 equals zero. And that's what the first row tells you. So I plug this into a computer algebra system. I just put it into a computer and I, I actually 
said, let's do RREF, and there's RREF, and this tells you, look at that first row, it says, so here's the equal sign right here, it's this long line here, which you don't really see, but the first row says, I1 equals 1, and the second row says, I2 equals 2, and the third one says, I3 equals 1, so from linear systems, we're able to solve and get something that's applicable to the real world. Now, some of you may not have liked this. You may, maybe you wanted to see something from the economics world or from the physics world. This is sort of physics here. Um, but there's just so many applications of linear systems. So do your homework, have lots of patience when you're doing those row operations, and I'll see you on the next video.